Torej, kot veste, letošnja parada letos poteka že 16. kar je seveda hvale vredna številka skozi leta s vsakič obogati z novimi vsebinami. Opozarja na družbeno aktualna vprašanja, na zadrege, na težave, ki se pojavljajo pri promoci tega gibanja. Prvsem lahko rečem, da Pogledamo iz različnih plati, se zdi morda Slovenija relativno neproblematična država, kar se tiče človekovih pravic, vendar ko pogledamo globje v sistem, ko pa pogledamo globje v razne odločitve in pa se tudi odnos, opažamo, da seveda temu ni tako. Žal, situacija tudi v Sloveniji razkriva, da živimo v družbi, ki ni najbolj strpna, ki včasih kaže tudi neke vrste nerazumevanje do drugačnega in da je odklonilna do vsega, kar ne sodi v tako imenovano sivo povprečje. In to seveda je slabo. Združba potrebuje odprtost, potrebuje seveda dialog in vsaka družba je toliko močna, koliko je moča njej naših pešjih člen in seveda tudi manjšine, tudi tiste, če rečemo, deprivilegirane skupine imajo svoje, mora imeti svoje pravice. In seveda težko je sprejeti dejstvo, da večina odloča o pravicah manjšin, zato seveda imajo civilizacije, zakone, imajo ustave, imajo tudi konvencije o človekovih pravicah, ravno zato, da začitijo tisto osnovno dobrino osnovne vrednote, ki je sami po sebi večina ne more nujno zagotoviti. Seveda bi si tudi sam želel, da smo v Sloveniji bolj odprti do vseh teh vprašanjev, o katerih bomo govorili tudi danes, da pokažemo več tudi solidarnosti, ker kot koncu ta odnos se kaže tudi v odnosu do begunske krize, tudi do drugih vprašanj, ki so vezane na pravice manjšin. Zdi se mi, da lahko seveda tukaj naredimo še ogromno, da je prostora za izboljšave veliko, moram reči, tudi sam sem bil presedečen nad izidi zadnjega referenduma in močno upam, da se bo odnos do tega v prihodnje spremenil. Prvsem pa se ne smemo močati, ne smemo biti tiho pri teh skvareh in reagirati moramo na nestrpnost. Živimo v žal v trenutku, v času, ko je na nek način ne samo nestrpnost, ampak tudi nerazumevanje in pa nek strah pred izstopanjem iz cilega popreča postov domena in zdi se, da ravno za tega smo na nek način tudi družbeno paralizirali. Zato se vrak ličem tudi na to, da se čim več odpira ta diskurs, ta diskusija in pričal sem, da v tem bo tudi parada ponosa dala svoj pomemben delež. Tudi seveda Evropska dimenzija, glede tega, je pomembna in če se Slovenija tako rada razgleduje po razviti Evropi, glede številnih vprašanj, ki se bodo tudi glede 
LGTB vprašanja zgledovala po razviti. Evropski parlament seveda tukaj igra pomembno vlogo, se tudi odziva na situacije v posameznih državah in zato se nam je zelo še toliko bolj pomembno, da v našo sredino povabimo gospod Urik Ljudaček, kot res na nek način proborko tega gibanja in prav je, da torej tudi iz prve roke slišimo, kako sama gleda na dogodke v Sveda Ameriki in pa na tisto, kar je začinost tega našega prostora. Tako da, madam Lunaček, Vice President of European Parliament, you're welcome. I'd like to give you the floor, so please, if you could, to address our audience. And in sveda še ob tem, še enkrat lepo zdrav sem skupaj tudi gospodu Igorju, mojemu dragemu kolegu, kot uradnemu predstavniku tudi v Evropski stranki zelenih. In mislim, da sveda tudi ta politika je pomembna za ozavešanje, ker skupaj sveda ponadimo mnogo več kot vsak posebej. Ulike de Florijos. In sveda tudi s organizatorki, ki jo prosi, da se pridruži Urlike pri razgovorju. Lepo zdrav vsem skupaj. Good day, everyone. First of all, thank you, Dr. Igor Šoltes, for the kind introductory words. And uh, also thank you to the, the, um, the Greens, the European uh, group, uh, in the, the group in the European Parliament, who actually um, also helped us to have this very, very important guest with us and very important events actually in terms of topic today with us during the uh, Ljubljana Pride Festival 2016. So thank you very much, Mr. Scholtes. Um, my name is Simona, I'm the chair of Ljubljana Pride Association and next to me is sitting Ms. Uh, Ulrike Lunacek. And um, you know, the, we are very honored actually to be able to host you here because for some years now <laughs> um, you are in a way in, in the wider uh, European context, uh, in a way in, in LGBT activism, particularly for those of us who are working more on advocacy level or are more involved occasionally also in politics, you're a little bit like, um, you know, a star. <laughs> so that's also uh, uh, me uh, making a compliment because I think it's, it's a privilege actually to have you here. Um, for our audience, just a couple of uh, introductory words. Um, this year's Pride Parade here in Slovenia is about making a very, very strong point um, for anti-racism and fighting homophobia. And, you know, uh, we try to uh, bring a cultural festival into this space, but we are also very, very strongly trying to open uh, different political topics that actually go hand in hand with this because we feel that there's a lot of things happening not only here in Slovenian society, but if we were look worldwide, that are very alarming actually when it comes to the rights of LGBTI people, but also when it comes to rights of other marginalized groups, other minority groups in societies. So we wanted to actually make this festival uh, a moment to raise awareness about those things. And uh, therefore, today's discussion with Ms. Uh, Lunacek it's, uh, it's, will have several layers. And uh, we already uh, discussed a little bit before that um, before we, we will want to go to um, uh, understand a bit better the role of European Parliament uh, in this so-called triangle of truth, uh, which is the relationship between European Parliament the advancement of LGBTI rights and actually the political context of the so-called Central Eastern Europe. And uh, we said that before we go into that more structural, more normative approach, we also want to look a little bit back into um, where it all started for Ms. Lonacek, because Ms. Lonacek has been in the European Parliament since 2009 
and uh, right now she's serving on the Committee on Foreign Affairs as well as on the Delegation for Relations with Bosnia and Herzegovina in Kosovo. So definitely uh, she is a politician and a person who's also familiar with our Balkan and uh, um, Central European context. Um, in 2014, um, Ms. Lunacic was elected Vice President of the European Parliament. Um, but I think there's a lot of uh, personal activism and political history for you also that started before that. And uh, one of the things uh, that maybe not everyone here knows is that Ms. Lunacek was uh, professionally involved also in NGOs, working on issues uh, related to development, cooperation, feminist policies and LGBT policies, um, so before even uh, entering into politics. And um, you know, for, for us, maybe this is, uh, this is the interesting part of the story, how it all be began for you, you know, as an activist, as a civil society, active person. Um, these three topics, development, cooperation, uh, feminism, LGBT rights, how do they link, actually, for you? Because for me, actually, it's, um, I personally, I think it's, it's a very important link, but sometimes it's not so usual, uh, very often, in civil society or otherwise, we stay very active in one of those fields. You know, they are so overwhelming sometimes, even maybe. So how was it for you, how, how you started? Okay, well, thank you. First of all, so thanks for, for having, and, and for having the pride this week and having me as, as part of it there. Um, I find it important to have the pride. Also, uh, in times when when uh, hatred and, and hate speech and hate acts like what happened uh, yeah, yesterday in, in Orlando and Florida are taking much also public, um, the public news of it. I think it's so important to hold Pride events and to be open and visible also for ourselves yeah, and not to let anybody drive us back to the closet. Um, but uh, for my personal history, and I hope I'm not going to get too long on that, <laughs> but uh, it, it is connected in a way. I, I grew up in a very conservative family. I'm from Austria, for those who don't know. Very conservative family, um, traditional parents. Mother stopped working when I was born and stayed, was a housewife all of her life. My father was an important person in the Austrian agricultural cooperatives, the leader of that, uh, until he... Until he uh, uh, resigned of Raiffeisen, not the bank, but the the uh, the, um, the agricultural uh, part of it. And uh, so, growing up there, I mean, th the word lesbian in my school times, which is like more than forty years ago, didn't even exist. Yeah, I was in an all girls school, but I asked those of us who met now again after you know forty years of graduation, but did we ever talk about that? I mean, an all girls school, no one one had a crush at each other. I mean, I had one of one of my friends, but I didn't even realized that, yeah? It didn't exist in my mind, yeah? There was nobody out anywhere, yeah? And so, it, And I always say that's a positive part of my story, because I didn't have any negative images. And that helped when I found out. I said, well, why not, yeah? What's the problem in falling in love with somebody, with somebody, yeah? <laughs> Even if it's a woman. <laughs> so that's one part. The other part, I was always, I, I studied languages, English and Spanish, for interpreting. So I was always, I always looked at other parts of the world, not just my own Austria, sort of, I always wanted to get away. I'm, in parts of my childhood, I wasn't very happy in my, my teenager times. So um, I also, I spent a year in the US when I was 16 at a, at a school in Iowa with an exchange program, and I met people from all over the world. And many from Latin America, somehow I was mostly friends with them, so that started me learning Spanish. And then I did a long journey backpacking through South America, 1978, um, part of it on my own. And I got to know Pinochet's Chile. I got to know people who were underground, uh, people whose family and friends had been killed uh, in the coup or were in prisons or had to go into exile, had been tortured. And I got to know these huge differences between rich and poor in Peru and Bolivia, which didn't exist at that time in Europe and don't exist now. And that sort of made me say, I have to do something myself in this world. Just having other people's thoughts pass through my mind as an interpreter without being able to say anything about what those people are saying, that I cannot do my whole life. 
And that's what started my activism in development uh, initiatives, solidarity initiatives, a feminist, uh, feminist movement in the Tyrol, in Innsbruck, where I went to university, um, very Catholic, very conservative at that time. I was part of the task force that started the first shelter for battered women and their children, and we managed to put it up, negotiating with the conservative government and with the Catholic women's organization. I worked there also for a while, and then found social work is not mine. I want to change the, the, the causes of things. Mm -hmm. um, and on and on, and then... Um, then I found out that I fell in love with women in this course of time. Uh, and I started being active also with, uh, uh, with the, the lesbian movement, not the, the, with the gay men. For a while I was quite a separatist lesbian feminist. <laughs> um, and then in the 90s, uh, from the development campaigning organization I worked with, mm -hmm. I was one of those who organized the NGO platform for the big uh, UN conferences at that time. I did it for the Conference on Population and Development in Cairo in 94. I negotiated with our government our platform. They put the, our text into the official document of the Austrian government. And we also managed to get three seats at, for NGO delegates at the official Austrian delegation to Cairo. So I went there as well. I even negotiated, sort of helped negotiating a bit, mm -hmm. and it was feminist issues there, it was issues like land rights, heritage rights for women, and it was issues like civil unions, yeah, that uh, some governments didn't want to have in the document, because it might mean lesbian and gay, same-sex marriage, yeah, and not just uh, heterosexual couples living together. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So that then made me decide to, to move into like parliament or party politics. Mm -hmm. So that is, is part of that story. But I also, for me, then finding out that I'm a lesbian, I also always decided that I have to, I don't want to live with fear. Yeah? Yeah. So also when I ran for the first time for the Greens 21 years ago in Austria for the parliament, uh, I had my international background, <coughs> development background, my feminist background, but I also said, when I ran, I said, yes, I'm also doing that publicly as a lesbian, because we, we had still three laws that prohibited um, propaganda, that prohibited organizations, and that had a, a minimum age of 18 for gay men. Yeah? So there were men in prison, because a 19-year-old had sex with a 17-year-old and went to prison. Yeah? So that still was the case then. Mm -hmm. um, and I simply found, and there was nobody public. We had politicians who were lesbian and gay, we know that. Uh, we had uh, the only two mm -hmm. men that were public were were um, um, two um, like TV talk show masters, but there was nobody in, in politics. So I decided um, I decided I, I never was afraid of it because I never I told my parents quite soon when I found out, yeah, mm -hmm. because it was like. Uh, I don't understand why I should hide it. Yeah? I mean, mm -hmm. you don't decide who you fall in love with. So what's the problem? Yeah? Um, and that also, I mean, as I said, my parents were very conservative. My mother is more, was a bit of like, well, what's, what did I do wrong? And I told her, no, you didn't. I mean, <laughs> that's not the, the thing. Mm -hmm. um, my father, and he was in a very high public position at that moment, and he told me uh, when I told him, on the phone, because they were in Australia at that moment, when I ran for parliament. Um, and he told me, it's good that you're doing that publicly because you have to keep your back free from people blackmailing you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that was, that helped a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I had the sort of my, my home family behind me. And my brother, mm -hmm. he was a, a hotel manager at that time, one of those five-star uh, thermal um, wellness hotels. And I told him, because we have the same last name, yeah. Yeah. And so, and I told him, it just in case somebody asks you that you know. And he said, well, do you think I should tell my, the owners of the hotel that we don't want any lesbians and gays here? Because we have quite a few. Yeah? <laughs> so this kind of attitude of my home family helped a lot. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, long story. <laughs> uh, no, actually, I think it's, those kind of stories are very important because they, they brought you where you are today and they, you know, they brought you to... Uh, um, not just for personal experience, but then later on, so structural work that, that actually makes a very important impact. 
And uh, when talking about, especially now this point about entering into politics and going into politics as an open uh, lesbian woman, and you know, here in Slovenia, it's um, unfortunately or for good reason, and that's also up for discussion, but very often uh, people that are active in NGOs um, and you know, activists, NGO workers, they actually avoid politics. So they, there is a stigma about being politically active, especially in a political party or going into elections and so on. Um, so uh, when, you, when you kind of look, look back now, uh, because you've had now quite some years of political career, um, what were some of the struggles, perhaps also for you, making this transition, if it was a transition? Um, why you think, maybe from your perspective, this is also something important or positive? Um, so yeah, maybe... Uh, yeah, well, I always say I, I wasn't born a politician. It's something, as I said, that came in life. I also, I mean, even long time ago when I was working with one of the NGOs, I trained myself, like, in public at meetings to go up front and sit in front and raise my hand for the Q&A session before it was over, sort of that I also would get the floor. And sometimes I even did it because no women asked any questions. Yeah. And it was only the men doing it. So I, I sort of, I trained myself in some of these activism, yeah, in the sense of making also women more, more present. Um, and so in a, certain, in a certain way, changing to, to party politics or parliamentary politics was more or less a natural progress because after these UN conferences, it was the others, the women's conference in Beijing in '95, and before some the human rights in Vienna, uh, it sort of became a, a natural next step for me yeah? because I felt well, it's a different. It's it was I also did politics as NGO, yeah? but it was a different level, and that just was a bit curious as well and, and sounded interesting, um, and. I know, I think maybe that has changed also since then. Now I know that in many countries, politics is seen as something dirty and something corrupt and something nobody really wants to be there. But, um, I mean, for me, it was also clear that the only party I could think of was the Greens, also in my home country. Yeah, it, there were others, the conservatives, I know them from my family background, said no thanks. <laughs> uh, Social Democrats were in a way too big for me, so with these big tankers that <laughs> take a long time to change their, their, their way. There were no liberals, yeah, and, and for the Greens were the only ones, that they were the right-wing parties, but no. Um, and so the Greens were the only ones, and I had cooperated quite a lot with them, and there were others who had come from NGO background who already had, had went in there, so that was a quite of the, 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 net, the most natural one to join. And um, um, it was, I think, the most the most difficult parts, it wasn't about being a lesbian, yeah? It was more about being a green, yeah, in a very uh, uh, grand coalition country, um, about being critical to lots of things that were going on in society. Um, in the party, we have structures, like, it's more the, the, the women's issue, yeah? We have quota in our party, yeah? We have quota for men and women, yeah? mm -hmm. um, so it was, sometimes I'm asked why this being open as a lesbian, where I had lots of like hate speech or things like that. Yes, I get lots of emails and Facebook, whatever, mostly from anonymous people, quite hate speech and things. The, the really bad ones, they go to the, the police yeah, and secret service sort of to, to have them uh, <laughs> somewhere online. Um, but I think for me, sort of getting in this world of, of politics and now becoming quite prominent in Austria, also in the European Parliament, with this role of, of vice president. Um, I think the most difficult part is not that of being the lesbian. The most difficult one is that you're a very public figure and that you hardly have any like free time or private time anymore. Yeah? Everywhere you are, you can be recognized, yeah? even, even in other countries, not just men. So that, that's a bit of the, the restricting part of, of life. But apart from that, I mean, I, I, I wanted to say also I was in, did I say that before? Because I think I told you I was in Warsaw on, on Saturday for the Pride March there. And uh, it's something, I, I'm, I'm, I'm here now, I'm going to the Baltic Pride on, on this weekend. I'm not going to be in Vienna for the first time in 20 years for the Pride, because it's the same Saturday than the Baltic Pride. But I decided there I'm, I'm more needed. Yeah? Mm -hmm. It's like this... this figure with this star or whatever. I, I don't feel like that, yeah, but it's like I know that I, I 
especially in this on this LGBTI field, I, I can me being there also in that position is something that that empowers people, yeah. mm-hmm. and that I find important, especially specifically at times like these. Mm-hmm. And what I wanted to say about Poland is, it was really great. Yeah, I had been at the Euro Pride in 2010, where we had five uh, sort of hate groups uh, sort of attacking us with some like bottles and eggs and things, and the police kept them to the margins. We were marching through the middle of town. Yeah, and this time with the government and the government they have, I was a bit afraid that it would be similar at least, and it was totally the contrary. There was one counter demonstration, but somewhere else, police had, had them somewhere else, and we were 30,000 people, even police said that, double from last year. Yeah? It was a colorful, happy, really pride. It was so great, yeah? Mm-hmm. And I have to say then, yesterday when I heard the news from the US, it was like, oh no, yeah. yeah. So there was this positive feeling from that even in Warsaw, even with the government that is there, yeah, mm-hmm. things were sort of getting better in, in being public and happy about it yeah, and, and celebrating the pride. Yeah. Uh, maybe just one uh, reflection on this because um, here in Slovenia we don't really have um, politicians or showbiz people or other kind of personalities that actually are understood here as role models or to get a lot of public uh, attention or media coverage and so on, that would be outed. So there are, from LGBT activism, there are people who entered in the past uh, the race for parliament or uh, tried to also um, be involved in political parties. But actually, you know, there is kind of also this situation that there is always these rumors that, of course, there are uh, a lot of people, maybe in politics, maybe in show business, that are gay, lesbian, uh, um, and um, but nobody is actually publicly saying that, stating that. Mm-hmm. And uh, when you say that, for example, for you being at the Baltic Pride, it makes a difference. So, what, what, how, how can, could you grasp a bit more concretely, like what does it bring actually to have in society? publicly out at, you know, standing role models from these different spheres. Because uh, I think that that would be something good for yeah. people to hear here. I find it extremely important. I always say it's, it's equally important to have equal equality in laws as to have visible lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people out. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, it's not just about laws. Yes, laws are important. I, I know. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a legislator, <laughs> so of course they are. Yeah. And we need more of it, and we really need equal rights. Yeah. But uh, laws alone don't help. I mean, sorry. Yes, of course, they also help. But if people do not change their minds and hearts about who we are, yeah, if they still have only negative images in their minds about lesbians and gays and transgender people and bisexual ones, if they still think we are ill, I always say, yes, I sometimes get the flu as well, yeah, so I can't get ill. But I'm not ill because I fall in love with women. That's stupid. Um, so there are still people who have that thinking. And, and lots of people simply are ignorant in a way that they, they simply don't know. They think they never met a lesbian or gay, and they've all met somebody, just they didn't know. And, I mean, you don't have to go around and say to everybody, hello, I'm a lesbian. Yeah? That, I mean, that's not necessary either. But it is important um, that regular people, people who are, in a way, sometimes afraid of us, I, I don't know what, because they maybe sometimes, yes, also, and I've met some women, when I told them that I'm a lesbian, they were afraid that I would, I don't know, attack them sexually or something. Yeah, so it, yeah it, it happens sometimes, not often, but sometimes it happens. And I know with men and with gay men and heterosexual men, that also happens, yeah? that they are simply afraid that the gay men might attack them yeah? or might like to rape them. Or, yeah. it, it's true. Th- these images, people have them in their minds. I then say, well, how about heterosexual women? Uh, they should always, I mean, there's lots more rape and sexual violence going on by heterosexual men against heterosexual women. So heterosexual women should be totally afraid of any man around. Yeah? So, I mean, just if you if you put it at the level of of, heter- of straight people, so but that's in many people's minds because they simply 
haven't seen enough. I mean, there's now, there's films, there is books with positive images of lesbians and gays. That has changed. When I had my coming out, there was nobody around, yeah? Nobody in show business, no, well, no Elton John, no Jodie Foster, whoever, nobody, yeah? I mean, they were around, but I, I didn't know them. Or, I mean, I didn't know about them, but nobody knew. So, um, uh, my experience is that also very conservative people, when I talk to them and then tell them what kind of real problems we have in life, yeah, if you don't have at least partnership regulation. Yeah? For example, I mean I remember when for my former partner when her father died in the in the in the NGO I was working, it was quite clear that I could get a day off in order to go to the funeral. Yeah? Because it was a, I mean, it wasn't at that time. It wasn't written in the regulation, but it was quite clear. Everybody knew that I was a lesbian. They knew her, so it was okay. Yeah? But for example, to have the right that if you work somewhere and your father-in-law or mother-in-law, whoever dies, that you get one day off, the same as if you were heterosexually married, yeah? uh, that you have the right to go to the funeral because of that and to get the day off, is something that. Then some people say, ah, oh, yeah, well, that you, you should have the right to do that. Mm -hmm. So very often, it, it's like these kind of talks, talking about problems that every human being has in his or her life, mm -hmm. makes people understand, at least some, not everybody, we'll never convince everybody. There will always be some who never will want to have equal rights for us. But I think I'm convinced the big majority of people, if you tell them those very concrete problems or things of life, they will get used to it. And they will get used to us holding hands in the streets or kissing each other goodbye at the train station or the bus station or at the airport. I know for some people it's still like a shock. Yeah? But the more they see us, I think it, it helps change people's minds. Yeah? And I had one more thing. There's a beautiful Czech film. It's called The Teacher, whatever that is in Czech. Uccelni or something like that. If you ever see that. It's a story of a, of a gay man who goes to some area in the countryside and he's a great science teacher and all the kids like him and the, 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 the director likes him and the, the, the other the, the lady, the old teacher lady, she really loves him and so on. Long story, and, but he, he wants to go back to Prague to have also a bit of more of gay life. And then he, he decides he'll go back to that village because he really loves the job there but he's not going to hide being gay anymore. And he goes to the school and talks, and the director says, oh, great that you are coming back. And this lady teacher who really loved him, like as a son, sort of, she said, oh, great that you are back. And he says, yes, I'm glad that I'm glad that I can teach again, but I'm gay and I'm not going to hide it anymore. And the director and the teacher, they go, what are, what are they going to say now? And then the director sort of gets up and says, all right, um, yes, there is this law now that allows that, so it's okay. <laughs> so that's why this, the, the thing of laws and visibility, how it connects, yeah? because it's talking about the partnership law in the Czech Republic. So that was the reason that the president, okay, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, nevertheless, uh, I think that um, sometimes the feeling is that in the second half of the 90s, um, to early 2000s, things were improving. You know, there were a lot of countries around Western Europe that were uh, getting to closer to marriage equality, that were um, introducing laws on equal treatment when it comes to adoption rights, uh, and a whole bunch of other area of human rights for LGBTI people, or at least for lesbian and gay people, let's put it, and be a bit more fair about that. Um, but somehow, it's very difficult to shake this feeling that in the last years, uh, we could say maybe it uh, was stimulated a bit through everything that started to happen uh, with the economic crisis, maybe it was uh, even before, or sometimes around this time, that actually now this new conservatism, when it goes to human rights, women's rights, LGBTI rights, actually it's becoming more than just a new conservative movement, it's actually uh, fueling a little bit also a lot more hate speech, violence, and in, in many contexts, in some countries also, attempts of laws or actual laws that not just revert the situation, but actually now we have the feeling that if maybe in the 90s there wasn't laws where we would feel included and we put, couldn't 
you know, get the same rights because we were not mentioned, you know, invisible or omitted from those, so you can access to the same rights. Now, actually, in more context, it's starting to happen that there are targeted laws to stop us from having uh, certain, certain, you know, equality with other citizens that are harmful and uh, they're inten intentional. So, uh, I don't know how you, how you see this development, if it is from your perspective also, from your experience, what you were working as a politician and, and in the European Parliament, do you also see this trend? Or is this only like a public perception? No, no, it is unfortunately a trend. I mean, but it, it, it goes together with other issues. You mentioned the economic crisis. Yeah. I think it goes together with um, general more economic instability yeah? and the, the divide between rich and poor also getting a bit bigger anymore. The sort of safety, social security nets that did exist before, um, they, they don't exist anymore. Yeah? Be it in Western Europe, in a part that was like Yugoslavia or, or part of the Soviet uh, sort of uh, um, Comic Con, whatever. Uh, all over, it's like the, all this this kind of stability that people could hold on to doesn't exist anymore, or just for some, or for less people than before, and uh, and there is, I mean, also the European Union is not in a good shape. Yeah, there was lots of hope also from like new member states in 2004 when when uh, entering the, the European Union. Also, when it comes to to uh, equality for lesbians and gays and things like that, because you had anti-discrimination legislation, yeah, at least in the field of of, um, uh, of the employment, yeah, mm -hmm. that every new member state had to implement. Yeah. So there was lots of this hope, and this isn't here anymore, that's true. And at the same time, I think together with, uh, it's a mixture of, uh, I don't really understand how this uh, anti well, the anti-feminism I can somehow understand because it's fear of women being too powerful in society, um, uh, <laughs> which some have, and which is true. And if you have 50-50 in every job, it means 50% of jobs for men and 50 for women, and that is less than men have now. So that I can somehow understand, that there is a fear that you will have less jobs, yet less money, etc., as a man. Um, it isn't true for all men, but for many. But the... Um, I think that some groups, and be it some of the religious fundamentalists, and these religious fundamentalists are increasing in whatever religion we have, yeah? be it the Catholic one that you have here, that we have in Austria, other parts, uh, but also uh, the, the Orthodox, um, Serbia, Russia, all those, and in the Muslim world as well. Um, so they are, they are getting stronger, and I think it, it, I mean, psychologically, or sociologically speaking, it has to do with the feeling of loss of control yeah, in society as such. So holding on to something that seems to be safe, yeah? you know, gender roles. It's clear who is a woman and who is a man. And don't mix. Yeah? <laughs> don't define it differently. That, I mean, psychologically or sociologically explaining, there is something to that. Um, but it is true that there are some parties and that there are some of the, some parts in sectors in the different religions and other groups in society who want to abuse that kind of fear or, or uh, uncertainty in society in order to get more votes, yeah? in order to get more people um, paying to them, believing in them. Yeah? And that is dangerous. Yeah? And that we see the rise of right-wing, right-wing radical, right-wing populist to right-wing extremist parties in, in many parts of Europe, east or west yeah? in the EU. That's, it, it's different uh, <laughs> different types of, of movements or parties, but the fact that they are sort of, that they that they have the, the fight against the, the gender craziness or something against, with them, the fight against feminism, the fight against women's equal rights, the fight against lesbian and the gays, but also the fight against the EU, yeah, and the fight for more, like, this nationalism, new, very often ethnically defined nationalism. Yeah. So all of that combines to, to make them stronger. They also, they, they convey to people that they have simple answers. Yeah? The world is a more complex one, that is true, yeah? like it or not. So all of that, I think, combines in, in making the struggle for an open society, and now with, with refugees, even more so, yeah? 
um, making the, the, the struggle for an open society where diversity is a richness, is seen as a richness and not as a threat. That is something that, that yes, we have to, we really need fighting for that more. Yeah, and it, it is important to, to, and also to, to have the courage to continue with that. Yeah? Because there are threats, yes, and that they can be also to our lives. Yeah, we have had, I mean, the, the terrorist attacks as well, also here in Europe. That, that are threats that make people afraid. Yeah? Mm -hmm. and, and I wasn't in Brussels when the attacks happened. I don't know whether you were in Europe, but yeah, I wasn't. But I was skiing some, I had some skiing days, but I read it and I heard it in the morning. But it's like, yes, you, you, when you then get to the airport in Brussels and you see where it happened, it, it, it isn't easy to live with that. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And it takes courage to continue, and it takes courage as well to... To, to make sure that we don't let ourselves not just put back to the closet, but sort of keep public spaces for us and maintain them. Yeah? And not let fear win, because then they will have won anyway. Yeah. Yeah? Um, now that we're talking about this, I don't know if uh, you're familiar, but uh, here in Slovenia, okay, Slovenia is uh, maybe not uh, such a prominent uh, country, uh, smaller, so we don't necessarily, uh, or at least we feel, we don't have to worry about terrorism in the same way. Um, but we have other kind of uh, violence actually appearing in society in the last years that I think we were not, as a society, we were not used to it before in the past. And this is the fact that in the last years there were several occasions where um, right-wing extremist groups of you know, young men mostly um, actually, we would. I think we can just say that they are new Nazi groups, you know, and they attack different groups in society when some events and so on. And in 2009, also during the Pride Week, there was an attack on a lesbian cafe here. Um, and um, just recently, in in this past week, we have here an autonomous zone, a factory rock, and there's a lot of Antifa movement, a lot of kind of. NGO people that uh, want to keep it in a way like a squad and uh, they've been having some fights with the municipality and with the security people and so on but actually what happened a couple of nights ago is that a group of 30 masked uh, young uh, people attacked them so basically these fights you know between something which we f feel it's very strong this rise of um, uh, this extremism actually uh, of, of groups that go now and you know take the right to beat up someone because they don't agree with the fact that let's say alternative culture and progressive forces uh, should uh, exist in this context and actually I think that LGBT people in this regard we are also very often at the other side of this where other groups in society or people feel that they can raise a gun or that they can take a bat and actually they can physically just uh, exterminate us in a way and I think that's that's the quite uh, re cruel fact of reality that we do live and then if we reflect this you know what's happening on the ground mm -hmm. and then we look at an institution like European Parliament you know there is a um, there's this uh, intergroup uh, you are co-chair of LGBTI intergroup in the European Parliament mm -hmm. And then there's also some initiatives in the last years in the European Parliament where you also have been active with them. There's also a famous Lunacic report <laughs> that actually is a report on, it's like EU roadmap against homophobia and discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation and gender identity and other mechanisms that you were involved with. So, you know, these two worlds, the, the one on the ground and then the world of European Parliament. How do they come together, you know? How can the work in European Parliament, how can a, a report or a resolution or directive, hopefully, um, from an institution on European level actually help on the ground, be it in Slovenia, be it in Poland, or maybe even in these relations to neighboring countries, like maybe the, if we remember a couple of years ago what was happening, is happened in Russia with the anti-propaganda law, for example. So how, how do you see these things connecting? Well, the European Parliament, I mean, the European Parliament was the first European institution in 1994 to write a report about lesbians and gays in Europe that didn't exist before. Yeah. So that we have a long tradition <laughs> of, of promoting equal rights for whoever. 
Um, and uh, it is true that still in the European Parliament, every vote, we, when we have votes, where it talks about sexual, um, um, sexual orientation and gender identity or about uh, LGBTI rights, we still win them. Yeah? Uh, but it has become more difficult because what we talked about before is also reflected at the level of European Parliament. We have a bigger number of... of we have, a, if you just look at it from the party structures, we have right-wing majority in the Parliament. That didn't exist before. Yeah? Uh, the liberals are on, on human rights there with us. Yeah? But then we have more people from extreme right parties there. Yeah? And there I'm not just talking about like the Austrian FPÖ or the Front National from France, uh, who I in, in our in, in German would rather call right wing populist, right wing yeah, party. But there's a real extremist which have at home also like violent parts like Golden Dawn from Greece like the German NPD with one seat, and, and, and Jobbik from, from Hungary. So they also vote, yeah? they have the right to vote because they were elected. Um, so, and they are totally against any of that, any of this gender craze and, and whatever. Um, so it has become more difficult to, to get the majorities, but we still win them, which is a positive thing. <laughs> So it means that also people from like the, um, the European People's Party and from the European Conservative and Reformers, the British Tories, they vote with us because Cameron says that same-sex marriage is something very conservative, which he is right. <laughs> so that is good to have. Um, and then when you talk about sort of what the parliament can do and what we do, and part is, is European laws, but that has become difficult because the council member states are blocking so many European laws. The main one is, I'm also a rapporteur for that, being the one in charge in the parliament in the, in the Committee on Civil Liberties on that, is the Equality Directive for Access to Goods and Services. There is the, the anti-discrimination law, the European one, uh, on, against discrimination on all grounds yeah, in employment, including sexual orientation. And when it comes to access to goods and services, meaning, for example, to rent a flat or to go to a, not to be thrown out of a coffee place because same-sex partners kiss or something like that, or not being allowed into a discotheque with a wheelchair, um, that there is not yet a European anti-discrimination law on that. It exists. It was, the Commission proposed it in 2008. The Parliament voted for it in 2009. And it's still stuck in the council, yeah? because the council, unfortunately, is co-legislator, meaning European Union member states, governments. Um, and there, that's what we see. Yeah? We, we, there are some member states who have uh, non-discrimination um, um, in access to goods and services, but not everybody. For example, the Germans have been blocking that for a long time, sort of on the forefront, some others hiding behind them. And uh, one of the arguments now used in Germany is that, you know, it would even if you wouldn't have to change your own law on that, it's, which is okay, but please support to have a European law on that, because also German citizens go other places and work in other parts of Europe, and they shouldn't be discriminated if they want to rent a flat, if they are in a wheelchair, or if they are um, uh, lesbian or gay. Yeah? But it still doesn't work like that. But then, when, because you mentioned the roadmap against homophobia, it was voted in, in February of 2014, uh, this was the demand to have a, a European wide strategy against homophobia. Mm -hmm. Because we have European strategies against discrimination of people with disabilities, against discrimination of women, against discrimination of Roma people, but we do not have one against discrimination of lesbian LGBTI people, at least lesbians and gays, because when it's homophobia. Um, and that was a report that I, I managed to get through Parliament with lots of anti-emails and, and campaigning against it before mm -hmm. by some of these very well-paid, more the, 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 the Christian fundamentalist organizations. I got 40,000 emails the week before, stamped my mail account, uh, demanding not to vote for it because it was crazy arguments like... Um, this report, and it, it's not a legislative one, it was not about the law. This report would make, um, uh, uh, would, um, would give privileges to lesbians and gays, and this is against the universality of human rights. <laughs> I mean, it was crazy, yeah? I mean, it simply was about um, 
about what could you do in order to, for example, yeah, get the normal LGBTI people in school books, yeah, or um, to, for example, to train police and, and health uh, services how to deal with LGBTI people. But very simple things like that, yeah? nothing about privileges. But it got passed. And now we had worked with the commission and pushed them to, to make this roadmap also uh, because the commission has to do it. We cannot yeah. do it. They haven't come up with a real strategy. They are doing a list of actions. And they want to do a campaign on that, also like with media and things like that. And they want to do some of the things we had. It, it's not the fully fledged strategy because they're afraid that if they push it through, they have, it has to go through the council, and if that is done, it will not pass the council. Yeah? So they do it without having to pass it through the council. So that is a reality also at European Union level, that member states' governments have, come more, have become more conservative, even some of the social democrats, like in, in Slovakia. Yeah? So that is a reality as well that we have to live with, but there is this list of actions. We're in the process of finding out what the commission really is going to do. Yeah, they haven't told us yet what they are planning. So there is high time that they do it. Mm -hmm. But it has become more difficult also at the, at the European institutions level. Mm -hmm. I, think it's, um, I think it's important to keep this in mind because, you know, one of the things that we are struggling here, and we saw it in the past two referendums which we had related to family code and marriage equality, is that actually the so few people come to vote. There's the, the, the participation in, in uh, actually politics and in democracy for voting has just gone down and down and down. And I think that that's also probably one of the consequences then that we can see that throughout all the levels of politics from national to the European, we then bear consequences of that. So I think that's, it's, it's always important to uh, raise people's attention also that we all have a chance maybe also to influence these um, how to say the balance in those kind of institutions so that um, you know ac active politicians like yourself then have less resistance when they're actually trying to to put um, a real advancement forward um, maybe just one final question regarding to uh, the role of European Parliament and, and in that context it's a um, it's a very interesting to see whether uh, European Parliament can somehow also reach out or can in a way also support um, LGBT activists or uh, you know community in countries that are not um, submitted to EU regulation per se. So neighboring countries, for example, um, there was quite some reaction when in Russia the anti-propaganda law was uh, adopted. And uh, that is, for example, for a lot of European institutions, a very important partner, namely Russia. So is there any leverage? Is there mechanisms to put this on the table or even to kind of try to influence in this regard to maybe protect the activists, maybe to, um, I don't know, make a deal behind closed doors? Does that happen or...? Yes, there is lots of that. If you mentioned that I'm also I'm the co-chair of the LGBTI intergroup in the European Parliament. I have to admit, I forgot the folders in Vienna at my home, which I wanted to bring to show you. But you find the LGBTI intergroup, European Parliament, you find us there, and the, acti the activities we do. And, um, and that is true to inside the European Union, mm -hmm. meaning like, for example, we, the, the intergroup, were some uh, members like Igor Scholtes, Tanja Fajon and Ivo Weigel from the Slovenian MEPs are members of that intergroup. Tanja Fajon is, is also vice president of that intergroup. Um, we, we see who goes to which of the prizes that are contested, that are difficult, like the one I went to Warsaw and going to, to um, what is it, Baltic, uh, to Vilnius this weekend. <coughs> And others go to different other places inside the EU, but also outside, be it uh, on the, the Western Balkans, different countries. I was at the 17th of May uh, march in Kosovo, in Britannia, that happened there as well. Um, or some go to Istanbul and, and to Kiev. Uh, Rebecca Harms, from the, our group, group leader from the Greens, was in Kiev yesterday. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, to Moldova. With, with Russia, it has become more difficult because uh, there are no prides anymore. Yeah? But what, that's the one part we do. The other part is that we, we try to influence also legislators where there are problems. That is true with Russia, it's more difficult. But inside the EU, I mean, these propaganda law were proposals also in Lithuania and in Latvia. 
um, and uh, also other countries outside you with Ukraine. We had the example that in the process of visa liberalization, um, Ukraine and other countries have to implement the anti-discrimination law in employment. And so the Ukrainian uh, the, 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 the parliament, after the uh, Euromaidan, uh, they eliminated sexual orientation <laughs> in the first part of the process of visa liberalization. They said anti-discrimination, yes, but without sexual orientation, because they didn't want to raise attention about the fact that it's also about sexual orientation um, uh, in employment. And then from the side of the European Embassy, the European delegation in Kiev, and from us in the intergroup, we were in direct contact with them, telling them, look, because they said, okay, for the first for the first stage, we accept it. Yeah? That was right after the Euro made, and we said, okay, but for the second, they will have to do it yeah, before they get visa liberalization. So it, it was like a negotiating process, mm -hmm. partially behind closed doors, on the phone, and when we met the ambassador, saying, mm -hmm. okay, it's okay if you say okay now, but for the next phase, they have to do it. And in the end, they had to do it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they wouldn't have get, gotten the green light for visa liberalization, which now might not come for other reasons, but not for that. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So that also, also in the process of enlargement to the Western Balkan countries, they have to, the part, the key European laws, they have to implement all of them, yeah? including anti-discrimination legislation. Uh, or, in, for example, in the in gender legislation, there's also legislation on, on transgender people inside. Yeah? That they have to do. Meaning they have to make the laws, whether they implement them, that also in the, in the progress reports the European Union does, the, mm -hmm. the Commission does, and we in the Parliament do, we always look into that as well. There's always a paragraph on LGBTI issues in and it's also about implementation. Yeah? So yes, there is a kind of pressure, and it was uh, Commissioner Fühle in the last period, the Enlargement Commissioner, who made it very clear when asked, and he said, yes, implementation of uh, anti-discrimination legislation and, and, and sort of non-discrimination of lesbians, gays, bi, trans, intersex people is part of the acquis. If you want to join the European Union, you have to do that. Mm -hmm. And also having like prides and so on. I mean, in, in Serbia, I sometimes have heard the question, how many prides do we have to have until we can join the EU? Um, so but it's a kind of pressure I don't mind. Yeah. Then they get have to get used to it. They have to protect us there. So yeah. yes, there is quite a lot of pressure that we also form the intergroup. And we have, I have to say, we are the biggest intergroup in the European Parliament with more than 150 members out of 750, most of them straight. Some of us are, les are lesbian gay ourselves, but most of them are straight. And I find it extremely important because we need straight allies. Yeah? And from all, all political groups, except the, the extreme right, except uh, the, the Front National and the FPÖ, etc. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we've heard, I think, quite uh, an important story. And uh, from my side, I have a final question. Namely, um, for the past 20-25 years, we've been hearing in European context and also in legislation context a lot about rights of lesbian and gay people. Uh, and in, of course, in, in different ways, also this uh, applies to uh, uh, rights of bisexual people because if in their same-sex relationships. But what about the, you know, everything which is uh, is or will have to be on the agenda for? Uh, the rights of transgender people, for the rights of intersex people. Um, so is that something which is the future of the work of the European Parliament? Like, uh, is that going to be one of the focuses? Um, is that something that maybe civil society has to push more? Uh, what, is, what is your vision for the future work, actually? What's going to be the trend? Yeah. It is included already. Yeah. Well, we have to say that intersex is a rather recent also Topic and the people, are just only the last couple of years, there have been some people I mean, also fighting for their own rights as mm -hmm. being intersex people. So, this is more recent than even transgender or than, than lesbian and gay and, and bisexual. With bisexuals, I always say, well, they have problems even when they are in a, in a same sex relationship, the legal, legal problems or other ones as well, not when they are in a, in a straight relationship. Sexual one. But for transgender people, that is included as part of the intergroup's work as well. But we try to have it more in the in the rights of where, it, where gender identity is the question. Mm -hmm. Meaning, in the women's committee, for example, when it gets to gender issues and include it there, and not always on the issue of sexual orientation, because it's two different things. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Transgender people can be uh, lesbian or gay as well, but but uh, the, 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 their 
problem, so to, so, so to say, not, does not come from their same-sex relationship, but from their gender identity. So it's a different topic. It's about whether you should be allowed to use uh, the other gender's sort of name or, or the first name, uh, whether you can have your identity papers changed even if you do not have the what is called gender adaptation surgery. Yeah, so that's the kind of issues that are being dealt there, or um, like that. So there, the parliament has been quite active in the in one of, in the in the, um, the the demand for gender strategy. Yeah, and there was just last week the first time, and, and we demanded that in the Libe committee, in the committee on civil liberties, a hearing were part of the hearing was on intersex people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yes, there we, it's part of the work, but I would say it's it, it's included in the work on lesbian and gay, LGBTI issues. I have to say also that sometimes I have the impression that transgender issues are for some people on the conservative side more easier, it's not always true, but sometimes legally easier to, to accept than same-sex relationships. I had, when the Greens in Austria, we negotiated with the Conservative Party for government in 2002, 13, 14 years ago. We didn't, in the end, we didn't get it through. But at that time, with the Conservative Justice Minister, for her, sort of transgender rights would have been easier to accept than same-sex uh, partnerships. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, maybe because it's about sexuality, or I don't know, maybe, but or, or, for same-sex relationships. And, and transgender, it, I think they accept it more easily that it's something sort of you're born in, well, in the wrong body, yeah, somehow, that it's easier to accept. It's not true for everyone, but it's a struggle anyway that, that mm -hmm. we, are, we are fighting together in the intergroup, but mm -hmm. in, some, in different committees, because mm -hmm. sometimes it's easier to work on that, like in the, in the women's committee, the gender, in the farm committees, mm -hmm. it's called. Any uh, openly transgender uh, people uh, in the European Parliament? At the moment, yeah, not. Like there have been before. Mm -hmm. There was one, and she was from UKIP, UK Independence Party, <laughs> who who was part of the intergroup as well. But I mean, we we agreed on her having. I mean, she had problems in her party, and, and she then stepped out of UKIP because of being discriminated as a transgender woman. And and she also said she was a lesbian. I mean, because all of that. She was she, she left UKIP, uh, mm -hmm. so um, we agreed on the lesbian and the transgender issues, but not on on UKIP's position on the EU or on, on the UK leaving the EU. Mm -hmm. And there was before the Italian uh, Vladimir, uh, what was her name? Uh, luxurious something. I, I forgot. But that was before I was in the parliament. Mm -hmm. So there have been some, mm -hmm. yeah. But at the moment, there's no, at least not anybody that I would know of. But mm -hmm. yeah. We, uh, also, this question is because I think here we've been during the festival talking a lot about visibility inside also the LGBT movement and inside uh, wider society for different actually groups uh, of an, in the so-called LGBT kind of uh, umbrella um, nomenclature. Um, nevertheless, I think uh, for, for my Sorry, this was a very fruitful uh, discussion and input. I would like to really thank you for that part. But I would like to ask, maybe somebody from the audience would like to uh, ask some question or make a comment or something like this, so that it's not just a okay. uh, <laughs> kind of dialogue here. Yeah. Uh, we have over there. Maybe I can pass you the microphone. It's easier to record your voice, OK? Is that? I don't know whether that goes to wait, wait, if I Oh, yeah, that's easier. <laughs> uh, hello, thank you for a very interesting discussion, Kalubnik from the Vidra, and um, thank you for coming here this week. We had the referendum, as you know, uh, the second one, and uh, we lost it again, and we have now a law that might become the reality, the law that gives all the rights to the couples apart from the name and apart from the opportunity for candidate themselves as adoptive parents uh, and I would like to ask you how is it in Austria in this respect? We know about the rights but do you think the forum will change as well in the future? Because Austria has been many times um, quoted at least in the Slovene Center for the one right politics is a very referential. So what's new about that? I know it's a European question but yeah. thank you. No, that's okay. Yeah, I think we're, I mean, with, with the Catholicism in our countries, we're rather equal. <laughs> and countryside, of course, and so on. Um, and having a Slovene minority in Austria. Um, but um, on that, 
it's, I mean, it's very clear that the European, the Austrian People's Party, the Conservatives, are blocking marriage equality. And there has been all kinds of issues. I mean, they didn't block anymore the, uh, the partnership law in 2010. It's already six years ago. It took them very long, and it was clear that the, the original laws that I mentioned in, that still existed in 95, the, the against no propaganda, no organization, and uh, a higher minimum age for men than for gay men than for heterosexual men and for lesbian women or heterosexual and lesbian women, was blocked by by the the Austrian People's Party because they were afraid that then the debate on partnership regulation would start. Of course, yeah, it would. And it did. And it was the courts that uh, undid these laws yeah, in, in 97 and in 2002. Yeah. So it took some time. And also then the partnership relation. Our, the Austrian partnership regulation um, is one that is wider than others in other parts of, of Europe. Uh, it includes, for example, um, the, the same rights for partners where one is from outside of the European Union, from third uh, country nationals. It's, it's very difficult anyway, but it's the same for heterosexuals. Yeah? It's also very difficult, <laughs> but at least it's the same. But it's not called marriage, yeah? and there are other issues. We are, not, we are not allowed to get married at the same place at the magistrate court than, than heterosexuals are, because some of the conservative mayors who are members of the Austrian parliament didn't want that we would walk up uh, to, the, to the marriage place um, when a heterosexual couple was just coming down, yeah, and they would sort of have to defend us in front of whoever. So that is part of Austrian reality, yeah. Uh, so it really will change as soon as, I mean, if the Austrian People's Party isn't in power anymore, yeah. The problem is now we have the right-wing populist FPÖ, yeah, uh, which is the strongest party in the polls, uh, more than 30 percent, and not just for the for the presidential election now, they, they almost got 50, yeah, they did not make. <laughs> majority, it was our ex-Green Party leader who is, if everything goes well, also with the um, with the contestation contesting of the Freedom Party now mm-hmm. uh, is going to be president. But for the for parliamentary elections at the moment, uh, the FPÖ has more than thirty percent. Yeah, Social Democrats around what twenty, I think it's about twenty five again. The Conservatives twenty one. We about twelve, thirteen, and the Liberals around eight. So. Um, it, We'll see what the next elections will bring, but the fact is that up till now the Conservative Party, even though many in their own party think it should be okay, yeah. Austria also, if you've got Europe Barometer, we've got I think 65 percent or so who are in favour of marriage. I mean, by now it's not a problem anymore. Yeah, it's like, but it needs the parties to do it. Yeah. Mm. So, and I think this is similar in, in in Slovenia. I mean, we didn't have any ideas of referendum like like you had. Um, uh, and I find it problematic if a referendum can be done with such a low turnout. Yeah? If you have, what, how many, 20, 30 percent of people who, who participated. But, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm still optimistic that it will change. Um, and, I mean, adoption law changed because of the courts, yeah? because uh, lesbians and, and two lesbians took Austria to court. Yeah? And uh, courts decided that they have to have the right, first of all, the, the stepchild adoption, sort of the child, of the, the biological child of the partner. And now it's even for adoption for um, other children. Yeah? So, I mean, one, one option is to go to the courts to really get things done. It costs money, that's true. But if couples go that way, it, it might also change things. And not just the your national constitutional court, but also the European Court of Human Rights. There have been quite some good mm-hmm. uh, legisl- no, um, verdicts from there. But it should be just easy to do. The problem is with the European Union. The European Union um, is not does not have the competence to rule on family law. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So from the European Parliament, we've said quite often it would be good if member states adopted partnership law, registered partnership, and even marriage. But we cannot make a law that binds member states to do it, mm-hmm. yeah? because family law, member states want to keep it for themselves. Yeah? Mm-hmm. And that's where we can say so, but we cannot tell them to do it. Mm-hmm. So you have to do it, we have to do it ourselves in all the member states, with support from the EU. <laughs> Thank you. There was one more question. Maybe I can invite you as well to come um, to the front. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, my name is Matiz. I represent, I am a Slovenia already mentioned, or my minority once today. 
But first of all, I want to say thank you, uh, Ulrike, for being such, a, such an active member of the European Parliament. We were also a couple of weeks ago in the European Youth event uh, in our panel discussion there and coming here to Lugan, it's uh, amazing to see you being so active. And uh, to my question, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of this, um, we compare a lot of times the relation between different minorities, not only LGBT, but also ethnic or national or disabled people or religious minorities. And um, in Austria in the last 70 years, we had the experience, uh, we as minority being discriminated constantly and uh, a lot of people had to assimilate in, during the last 70 years. So also the minority got uh, way smaller. Just the Slovene minority. The Slovene minority, yeah. But also the other minorities, the Roma or the Burgenland Croats, or um, only the Hungarian maybe got uh, bigger. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, how do you see, it? What, was it um, a strategical or historical mistake of the Austrian uh, politics um, not to deal more with the topic of minorities of any kind, because the national ethnic minorities were, on that, were not on the agenda, but it should be, so through that maybe we could also learn uh, or would be better prepared also for the LGBT you know, minorities or these issues, but it was a total ignorance of these topics uh, in the history of Austria. Um, because there are a lot of connections between minorities of all kinds when it comes to discrimination or to social inclusion or also to social, inclu uh, social inclusion, but yeah, discrimination and assimilation. Um, how do you see this uh, correlation? Well, I, think, I mean, in Austria, it took a long while to to give the right of like ethnic minority give ethnic minorities the right to to be legally recognized with the Volksgruppen Gesetz, yeah, sort of. And it, I mean, that, that what it took most, you know, is for the Austrian Slovenes, for the Queens and Slovenes. But that had to do with the very specific history and and, uh, and present in in Carinthia, with uh, the big fight between sort of German nationalist old Nazis. Uh, and and uh, and and Austrian Slovenes, yeah. And I think, I mean, I started uh, sort of getting active on that topic at the end of the 1970s, <laughs> when I was with some other young people who invited young people from different parts of Austria to Plibakom uh, and Michael, not Plibakom, and so on in in, <laughs> in the south to 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 spent Easter with families there and find out they are all but communists. I mean, they're very traditional Catholic Austrian farmers people and so on. Uh, uh, and just to learn that, that they're just Austrians who speak, who happen to speak Slovene for certain reasons, yeah, and they should have at least the same, the bilingual signs at the entrance of the, of the villages and of the places. So it took, I think it took too long, yeah, for, for Austria and also the government to to recognize these very symbolic and visible um, signs of bilingualism in, in south of Austria. And I think in that sense there is a connection, this issue of visibility. We have it with ethnic minorities, we have it with LGBTI people, and it is important yeah, because in, in politics, as I said, laws are important, but symbols are also important. Because people, I mean, we react as human beings to, to symbols, yeah? be it in language, be it in, in things we see. Yeah? Uh, so if you don't see um, that there are people who speak a different language living there and not the, the, the majority language, then why should you, why should you respect them yeah? if you don't even know they exist? Yeah? And the same with lesbians and gays. Yeah? If people don't, don't realize that we exist as their when we're sitting in the coffee beside them or in the, the airplane or the train beside them, yeah? then, then how should they respect us yeah? if they don't even know we exist? So in that sense, I think this fight for visibility and for symbols also in politics is extremely important. Mm -hmm. And also for ethnic minorities, the, the right to speak your language, yeah? at least in some part of the country, the right to... Um, I remember friends of the Slovene minority when they asked in Klagenfurt for a train ticket to uh, Michel in, in Slovene, they didn't get it. Yeah, I, don't, I hope this is not. I don't know. <laughs> I found it interesting that when, when uh, at the end of, of, of Yugoslavia yeah, and with Slovenia becoming a country of its own, 
and that suddenly the, the borders were open, that suddenly people in, in Carinthia, in Klagenfurt and in other places, tell of it, yeah, they, they, the, the, like the restaurants and the bars, suddenly they spoke Slovene, yeah, and they put <laughs> signs there that whatever food they had, I don't know, cast noodle or whatever, <laughs> was there in Slovene suddenly, yeah, so suddenly they knew how to speak when it's about business. That I found <laughs> very interesting. Mm -hmm. I think that should, I mean, very often, and that's also with, with lesbian and gay people, companies and, and business, I think there, this, this issue of making diversity structures in their, own, in their own companies is something that in the end helps business. Yeah? I mean, it, it should be there for our own right as an ethnic minority or as a lesbian and gay minority anyway. Yeah? But it also helps people being motivated in your job, yeah? if you know that you are respected for what you are, yeah? and that you don't have to hide. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I think that the business community is one that should be an ally yeah? for ethnic minorities, and also because knowing languages by now, I mean, in this united Europe, I mean, speaking more languages is an asset that, that <laughs> everybody should be happy if your kids learn two languages when they're small and not have to learn them than when, you, when you're bigger. Yeah? So I think that's the part where I find also politics and, and business should be a lot more open to, to, diff to the positive effects of differences in people. Mm -hmm. yeah? And, and yeah, use them, in, in not, in a neg not abuse them, but make sure that there's respect for it. Yeah? It helps everybody. As that it could be that easier. <laughs> Thank you. I think I have here a final question or comment, and then I think we'll close slowly this round. Yeah, hello everybody, Igor Yulishic is my name, uh, as uh, my colleague also Igor mentioned in the uh, in, uh, opening speech, I'm, uh, I'm the chair of Slovenian uh, SMS uh, Greens, so uh, the representative of Slovenia in the European Green Party, and we were also proudly representing your rights in the, in the referendum. And uh, I was a bit disappointed after this referendum, not because they got 23% of all population, but because two-thirds of Slovenia said it's not our problem, uh, we will stay at home. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, then I said, look, next time it will be about rights of farmers, next time about rights of teachers, and because you're not a teacher and because you're not a farmer, you will stay at home. But at the end you will be alone when you will uh, ask for your rights. And, uh, and uh, normally if you lose a game, uh, which is played fairly, you say, okay, they were stronger, they had better arguments, and I respect this. But this was not the case in this referendum. Because we, who were protecting the rights of everybody, were, uh, were talking about human rights. And they were selling the good which is always best to sell, and that was fear. Because if you want to sell a vac vaccine against, uh, against the flu, you must first sell the fear. You must say, in Asia, seven people die because of this flu. And then uh, everybody will buy it without any other commercials. And that's what they were doing. They will take your children away and put to the homosexual, uh, uh, homosexual pair. They will, uh, they will, uh, they will, for example, uh, erase from your marriage certificate that you are man and wife, and you will be just person one, person two. And that were their arguments. And when I when I talked with people who were not involved in this case, they said, "Okay, I will not go there because for me, we, we, I still want to be a husband and wife." Uh, and uh, so they, they didn't succeed uh, on arguments because they didn't have any. Sorry, I, I was uh, on, the, on the worst debate ever, yes. I believe, in the, in the Central and Eastern Europe. <laughs> Sorry to say, because it was really... Uh, but uh, we must say that had, they, 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 they knew how to campaign and they had a good which was sold very well and that was fear. Mm -hmm. And that's why... I, I, I'm telling openly, for example, uh, in the beginning, uh, I was thinking, okay, if the parade is a good way how to demonstrate uh, your sexual orientation or not. And I said, okay, it could be something maybe uh, less, how to say, uh, less, provocative. Uh, uh, less, pro less provocative, yes. But at the end of the day, uh, you, you must show. You must show up. You must, uh, you must say that you are not different, that you can be the same good doctor, the same good teacher, the same good farmer as everybody else. And, that is, uh, and uh, you must take them the only weapon they have in their hands, that's fear. Mm -hmm. Because when people will not be afraid of, of it, then the next referendum, if any way uh, it will be needed, it will be successful. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we need to go uh, and we need to continue with our battle. And uh, I think that uh, the future is in your hands, but I hope 
I will not speak like in the past, you know, we say future is in your hands, but the present is ours, and future never came. I hope this future will be very soon, and uh, I congratulate you, and, and please be proud and show what you are. Thank you. I mean, that's what is illegal. This issue, sometimes the arguments they use, it's so ridiculous, yeah? I mean, the idea that somebody would take away the fact that somebody's husband and wife, I mean, huh? <laughs> and it's like, yeah, I know they use that, but it's also like this idea that we would be taking something away from them. Usually, I mean, in Austria, the argument we often used was, look, it won't even cost anything if there's same-sex marriage, if that's the problem, and nothing else. I mean, nobody, yes, maybe some gay men or some lesbian women will not get married anymore heterosexually because they're afraid of not doing it and of being sort of ousted yeah. from somewhere. But if they do that, and I'm, some friends of mine have done that a long time ago, they create troubles for their partners, their heterosexual partners, who then years later find out and see what was that that we had. And even if they have kids, yeah, what does it mean if somebody marries heterosexually in order to avoid being seen as lesbian or gay? I mean, that creates lots of, not, not fear, but lots of pain. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, even that, that shouldn't happen. So, but then when they say, yeah, we take away things from the world. I mean, heterosexuals do it themselves, that they break up and have divorces. We don't, they don't need us for that. <laughs> no, it's really, and it doesn't cost anything. Yeah, maybe they would get a bit less taxes. But there are other ways to raise taxes. I mean, <laughs> taxes. Yeah, just that for a remark. Thank you very much. I mean, for us, it's, um, it was an honor and a pleasure to host you here. And thank you for coming. Um, and yes, actually, with all the different question marks, why pride, uh, why having a parade, why going around the streets and in the city, it's because actually um, we take it as our right to be visible and to have a parade like any other group might ha have a protest march because they have other issues in society they want to raise, be it workers' rights, be it women's rights. And, uh, and also to show exactly what you were saying, you know, to show the diversity also of the community, the culture, uh, sometimes the mundanity of it, because sometimes it's actually very boring, <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes it's actually very feathery and glittery, and, and both is okay, and I think that's something that the parade is trying to show in this environment where we are particularly kind of pushed to be... Uh, you know, everybody should be like everybody else. You know, you should never stand out. And I think that's also something we're trying to say, no, that's not what diversity is about and it's not what also human rights are about. It's the fact that we, as human beings, we are worth equally. We are not, uh, we, sh we should never accept any kind of hierarchies. And in our political message of this year, these hierarchies that society puts between people, we call it racism. And that's why also we say we are, you know, fighting against racism and homophobia because that's exactly what society is doing. They're putting hierarchy between people and we don't take it. We feel people are, and, and we stand behind the fact that, well, we as people, we have equal value and worth and period. That's it. Exactly. Maybe just one addition to that. I learned a long time ago when I did my studies in, in the U.S. For, for some time, there was a group of, at that time it was, um, um, uh, people with mental disabilities and that was at the end of the 1970s beginning of the 80s and they were organizing themselves and they had a slogan that I at that time then took to myself and when I went into policy they said it's normal to be different and I think also addressing the issue of norms because very often we're seen as not being normal yeah? mm -hmm. and saying well yes there are societal <coughs> norms but it's normal to be different yeah? mm -hmm. so there, the differences are part of the norm yeah, between yeah. us. So I also find that important to, to look at this. Yes, we're all different, but we're all equal as human beings. Thank you as well. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you, dear audience. Uh, please, I think every one of us deserves now a little applause for the, to, to finish <laughs> this. And then when we go out, there is a very small uh, appetizer uh, waiting for us. So also welcome to stay with us a few more minutes outside. Okay? Thank you very much.